All right, Dr. Michael E. Mann is a distinguished professor of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. Dr. Mann, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you. So I'm very happy to be talking to you today because I talk politics all the time. It is endless politics, left, right, craziness, Republican, Democrat. Now, I'm pretty sure they're going to end the world, but you focus on something else that might beat it. It might beat politics to ending the world, climate science. Well, yeah, I mean, some, some people have called it the science of doom <laughs> because uh, we are, you know, studying, uh, you know, this problem, climate change, human-caused climate change, that has grave implications for all of, you know, civilization. Now, you know, the, the Earth uh, won't uh, end because of climate change. The real question is, will we preserve an Earth that we can thrive on, uh, especially with a growing population nearing uh, seven, you know, more than seven billion. We're on our way to nine, 10, 11 billion people. And yet, uh, if we allow climate change uh, to proceed, if we allow the warming of the globe to uh, continue and all the impacts that that has, uh, we'll see, you know, a lot more uh, competition for diminishing food and water and land. And, and that's uh, deeply problematic. National security experts who studied uh, uh, the implications of the projected changes in climate will tell you that uh, for those reasons, this is really one of the greatest threats that we face, even from a, a security standpoint. Uh, yeah. In decades ahead. And you know, some of this, it sounds like a joke when we hear our leaders say, well, something like Syria is partly related to climate change. And I, I've even joked about it because it sounds so silly. But when you have diminishing resources, people do all kinds of crazy things. But let's just start. We're going to do climate science 101. I really want to unpack some basic stuff so that people, so that next time someone on Twitter is yelling at me about it's a hoax, <laughs> I can say, here's the video, here's the stuff. So let's just start simply. Man-made climate change is it real, and how do you know that it is real? Yeah, so it literally is the consensus of the world's scientific community um, that climate change is real and it's human caused. And you know, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences has weighed in with that conclusion. Um, this is the you know, most authoritative uh, scientific body uh, in the nation, and it was actually initiated by a Republican president, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Hard to believe now, right? <laughs> so, you know, to, sometimes uh, some of the critics are, uh, uh, are from the Republican side of, of the aisle when, you, uh, you know, when it comes to climate change. Um, you find that a lot of the skepticism and the contrarianism does come from one side of our political spectrum. And I like to remind those folks that, you know, this, you know the, the Republican Party actually uh, embraced science um, uh, for a long time. And in fact, uh, even presidents, you know, Nixon, uh, Bush, uh, George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, uh, Ronald Reagan, actually um, acted on global environmental problems and saw uh, a role for, um, you know, market-based uh, solutions to these problems. So it shouldn't be a partisan political issue. Uh, it's unfortunate that it has increasingly become one. Yeah. But the science, you asked about the basics. Um, how do we know that this is happening? How, why is it that there is so, such a robust scientific consensus that every scientific society in the U.S., uh, in Europe, around the world, that's weighed in, has said, has come to the conclusion that climate change is real. It is human caused. When you um, say when you say robust, real quick, it's something like ninety-seven percent of the scientists in this field, correct? So this isn't. We're not yeah. talking seventy thirty. I mean, we're talking really margin of error kind of stuff, right? No, that's right. And, and in fact, in one recent survey, uh, they argued it's closer to ninety-nine. That the study that found ninety-seven percent was sort of. Uh, bending over backwards to, uh, you know, to um, make concessions to the critics. Um, okay. And a more accurate number might be closer to 99 percent. So, wow. yeah, if you go to a scientific meeting, if you read a peer-reviewed scientific journal, you're not finding scientists contesting that the globe is warming or even that it's human-caused. Uh, the real debate when it comes to the science uh, is about, you know, just how much warming will we see? Um, and precisely what will the impacts of that warming be? But the scientific community is no longer doubting that climate change is real and human caused. And, and the reason for that is this is really basic uh, physics and chemistry that goes back uh, nearly two centuries. Uh, there's a scientist, uh, uh, Joseph Fourier. Um, now, 
he gave us the Fourier series in mathematics, and uh, he gave us the law of heat conduction. The way you describe how heat moves through objects was Fourier. Um, this guy lived in the early 1800s. He understood that there was an atmospheric uh, greenhouse effect. Okay, so over, literally over a period of 200 years, we've we've been refining our understanding of this problem. But the basics that certain gases in our atmosphere uh, warm the atmosphere, warm the surface of the globe. Uh, that's fundamental science that's been known for nearly two centuries. We wouldn't be able to explain why Venus is as warm as it is or why Mars is as cold as it is if it weren't for our understanding of the greenhouse effect. Uh, the U.S. Air Force wouldn't be able to design heat-seeking missiles because to design a heat-seeking missile, you need to program in information about the heat-absorbing properties of the surrounding atmosphere, the greenhouse effect. Mm -hmm. So what is it, so you guys are looking at all of this information and you see this and I hear a lot of people say, well, the earth has gone through cooling periods and warming periods and all of this stuff and you, you've heard all of it, obviously. How do you make the direct correlation between what humans are doing and the actual growth? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and, and you allude to one of the critical issues here, which is it's really the rate of changes uh, that we are seeing. And, and you have a theory behind this. You came up with the hockey stick theory that really explains the rate, right? In a sense, the hockey stick curve uh, we published, uh, it's hard to believe, more than a decade yeah. and a half ago. And there yeah. are many other studies now that come to the same conclusion that, yeah, the recent warming is unprecedented as far back as we can go, thousands of years. Um, but even over longer time frames, let's go back to the age of dinosaurs, okay? Um, there was a time uh, in the early period, the Cretaceous period, when dinosaurs uh, roamed the planet a hundred million years ago when we know that uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide were actually substantially higher than they are today. Uh, and we know that the Earth was very warm at that time. In fact, it was basically as warm as we would expect given so the... How, how do we know that from, from the carbon dioxide? How do we actually know? Because I think a lot of it's, people just hear that. They say, well, the carbon dioxide was more, but what does that have to do with the temperature? Yeah, so um, the way we know temperatures were warm, uh, geologists can see when there's evidence of ice, and we know that we had an ice-free uh, planet. That there was no evidence of any, you know, the sort of scraping of rocks that you would get if you had uh, ice sheets. Um, so we're uh, quite certain that uh, the Earth was ice-free at that time. And if you do the calculations, um, that's consistent with the Earth having been uh, several degrees warmer than it is today. And so the critics will point to that, right? They'll say, well, here was a natural warm period. There weren't any SUVs around back then. Um, and it's true that over a time scale of 100 million years, nature is pretty powerful. And nature can vary the concentrations of these greenhouse gases on those time scales through changes in volcanic activity, uh, plate tectonics. So over a time scale of a hundred million years, uh, nature is pretty powerful. And uh, the concentrations of these greenhouse gases on those time scales um, uh, are ruled by things like volcanic eruptions, plate tectonics. What we're doing is we're taking all of that carbon that was buried naturally by the Earth over that ensuing hundred million years since the early Cretaceous, as the climate slowly cooled down, nature slowly buried all that carbon. What we're doing is we're now digging it up and we're putting it back into the atmosphere, but we're doing it over a time scale of about a century, a million times faster than what nature would be able to do on its own. And so that's really the issue. We're talking about rates of change that exceed anything that uh, living things, let alone us, have had to adapt to in our past. Right, so when you see that, then that is the obvious link to the, the new variable here is us, right? I mean, is that just, is that as easily as you can make that jump then? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, and just a week ago, I was out at the Scripps Institution for Oceanography in San Diego, uh, which is one of the world's leading uh, institutes for climate studies. Um, and it's also, uh, it was the home of Charles Keeling, who back in 1958 first began measurements of atmospheric CO2 on Mauna Loa, on the top of this mountain in Hawaii, this very pristine location. And many of your viewers will have seen the famous Keeling curve, which shows how CO2 has increased over time. And there's a little bit of an annual wiggle, and that's sort of an interesting part of the curve. It has to do with the seasons. Mm -hmm. But 
you see this inexorable climb, and that climb took us past a new threshold. A few years ago, uh, we crossed 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, Pre-industrial levels were about 280. So we crossed 400 parts per million uh, for the first time in what we think is literally millions of years. Wow. So it is an unprecedented experiment that we are performing with this one planet that we know, which can, you know, uh, provide a home uh, for us. Yeah, so everything that you've laid out to me sounds like science. It sounds like these are quantifiable, testable uh, practices that you and, and your colleagues have used to come up with some answers here. But I know that there's a certain amount of people, and unfortunately it's a, it's a large amount of people, even if we don't want it to be, that simply don't believe in just some of the things you're talking about. So for example, if you were to say, well, millions of years ago, this X, Y, and Z happened, well, they would say, well, actually, you know, according to the Bible, the earth is only a couple thousand years old or something like that. How do you fight that? Because you're trying to use science and rationality, and this is, I talk about this in the, in the political uh, arena all the time. You know, if you're trying to talk rationality and someone else is just trying to talk, you know, well, my, my imaginary friend or whatever it is, that, that's a tough battle to win. Yeah, no, absolutely, and, and it's a battle we constantly fight. Um, uh, when it comes to any er uh, area of science where there's you know, a potential conflict between the findings of science and the beliefs of uh, certain groups of people, um, obviously with uh, the theory of evolution, um, there's some opposition to the theory of evolution that, that comes from certain parts of the uh, religious community, although I would uh, note that um, the Pope, for example, uh, uh, it firmly accepts the science of evolution. He also firmly accepts the science of climate change. Yeah. And in fact, he has been a very important messenger uh, when it comes to the issue. Um, but I, I think what you find um, is that uh, there's a phenomenon um, that uh, has been co uh, termed cog uh, uh, cultural cognition. Um, and there's a scientist, uh, Dan Kahan at Yale, who, who studies this. See? And what he's looking at is um, how do people process information that they're provided? And it turns out um, one of the things that's very relevant here is that people will often, they have sort of an ideological filter for the way they take in information. Mm -hmm. And that filter will reject um, those you know, facts, those pieces of information that conflict with their underlying worldview, uh, outlook, ideology, um, you know, sometimes called cognitive dissonance. Right. But what it means is that you can't reach those people simply with facts because they're not really looking at it in terms of the evidence per se. They're looking at this as, well, you know, I'm part of a tribe. Um, I'm, I'm a loyal, you know, a Tea Party Republican. And I know that Tea Party Republicans are against climate change. Um, so uh, it, it's irrelevant fact, whether they're against climate change because climate change is still coming for you. Right, and it doesn't care, you know, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. <laughs> right. and it doesn't, but nonetheless, um, it turns out it, it's difficult to reach those folks because they're not necessarily open to being convinced by logic, by data, by facts. Um, there are ways to reach those folks, and there are a number of uh, you know, researchers and just practitioners who are out there trying to find ways to communicate to those who have otherwise been sort of resistant to accepting uh, the science of climate change, resistant to believing a pointy-headed academic like me, <laughs> but uh, you, know, you get a four-star general in front of them or a, a former uh, congressman like Bob Inglis uh, of South Carolina, who was a conservative Republican, had a nearly perfect, you, you, may, I, you may have even uh, talked with him uh, at some point. No. Uh, he, a fascinating guy, he had a perfect conservative voting record, or near perfect, um, one in one of the reddest parts, one of the reddest districts in South Carolina with an overwhelming um, uh, uh, amount of support, 60-something percent uh, of, of uh, the vote. But he made the mistake of speaking out about the issue of climate change on the, the House floor. He's an evangelical Christian, and he sees this as a matter of preserving creation for future generations. And he decided that he really needed to speak out about uh, climate change. Well, that earned him the ire of the Koch brothers, 
who uh, heavily funded uh, a primary opponent, uh, Trey Gowdy, mm -hmm. you may have heard of. Of course. Who, who, who defeated him in the primary election. What they didn't expect is that Bob uh, Inglis, now uh, in need of a job, would decide to devote himself to talking to conservative audiences and talking about uh, how free market approaches to uh, dealing with this problem make sense in terms of uh, conservative principles and trying to convince some of those uh, some of those folks who again might be resistant to being told something by you know a pointy-headed academic or a scientist but you know by a fellow conservative who shares uh, very much shares their values um, you know uh, perhaps there's room for uh, to, to make headway there so yeah. Are you amazed how politicized this has become? Because for me, it's like you can't choose whether to believe in science. I, I always say, you know, I'm not a scientist, so if I'm going to talk about these things, I have to find some people that have done the work and, and trust them. And then if someone comes along and, and disproves what they're saying, so be it. I'll look at new evidence after. But I can't pretend that I know what's going to happen here. And this has become, and I think you've already alluded to it, probably a lot because of the Koch brothers, this has become incredibly politicized. So first, can you talk a little bit about what the Koch brothers' involvement in sort of the anti-science sure. part of this is, and then just generally how that's steeped, how that's sort of moved into the uh, political arena? Uh, sure thing. And in fact, I've, I've seen the sort of efforts uh, of the Koch brothers firsthand in my book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. Um, I talk about all the attacks that were uh, lodged against me. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've had a lot of attacks. I, I, <laughs> I, I went through the list and I thought we, we could go into this, but I, I wanted to really stick to the to the point yeah. here. No, and, and it's because the hockey stick, which we spoke briefly about, this curve that showed how unprecedented recent warming uh, is in a long-term context, that um, uh, was seen as a threat to the forces of inaction, uh, to those who oppose regulating carbon emissions, because it told a simple story that people could understand. And because of that, I think um, uh, those, you know, the forces of denial uh, saw it necessary to try to discredit me personally mm -hmm. uh, in an effort to discredit the hockey stick. And they've been trying. Uh, I've been fighting back uh, for, for, you know, well over a decade now. Uh, and a lot of those efforts, it turns out, if you scratch just a little bit beneath the surface, what you find is that a lot of these are paid advocates, front groups, organizations that are funded, guess what, by the Koch brothers. Um, and so a lot of this, uh, the, you know, the so-called Tea Party, in a sense, was manufactured by the Koch brothers. Uh, uh, Americans for Prosperity, uh, you know, this is a lofty sounding group who couldn't be for prosperity. <laughs> They're um, really good with the names, all of these groups, right? Oh, yeah. They, those guys, they can't be bad guys. They're for goodness and prosperity. Yeah, if they had called themselves uh, citizens for uh, dirty fossil fuel energy, you know, <laughs> for a little more truth in advertising, right. then maybe, uh, you know, they wouldn't get as much support. But they're very good at that. They're very good at reframing the debate, making it uh, about uh, values, um, seemingly making it about uh, the economy, you know, that, oh, acting on this problem will destroy the economy when just the opposite is true. And if you talk to leading economists, they'll tell you the cost of inaction right now is already far greater than the cost of taking action. And just look at, you know, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, uh, a storm that we know is made worse uh, by climate change.